Okay, the red light is on. It's five after, so I thought we could get started. So you are in the How to Become a Distributed Company step-by-step -step guide session. It is the post-lunch, post-keynote session, so if you fall asleep, I won't blame you. Um, let's get started. So I wanted to start with who am I? Well, I'm Ivan Stegic. I'm an, I'm an immigrant from South Africa. I have Croatian ancestors. I'm the founder of 107, and we've been in business since 2007. Uh, I used to be a research physicist at Honeywell, and then at Imation. I was part of a team that uh, manufactured, researched, built, designed, did the whole thing with CDRW, DVDRW, HD DVD. We made everything Wapaton, North Dakota. We did all the research for it in Oakdale. It was great to be on that team. It taught me a lot about large corporations and how they work. I also have a degree in psychology, so my current role as being responsible for the well-being of the humans that I interact with, either the clients of whom some are here or the employees, really brings me a great amount of joy. So that's kind of what I do all the time at 1070 these, these days. I shouldn't have run up the stairs, so <laughs> let me get my breath here. So who is 107? We're a Drupal agency. We create and care for Drupal powered websites. And we've been around since April 16 of 2007. And I started the company in my basement. So you could say I was distributed right from the start, just being me. Although we use Drupal all the time, we also use some tangential technologies like React. The team itself is eight full-time employees. And by FTE, I mean people have benefits, they have 401k, they um, have a tech stipend, and that turns out to be pretty important if you're a distributed company. Uh, they get to en enjoy sabbaticals. And this year we added two new uh, benefits, uh, water restoration certificates and renewable energy credits. So basically 107 pays for the green version of the water and the electricity that every employee uses at home. So we could somehow claim all the websites we make are green <laughs> to a certain extent. So that's 107. We weren't always a distributed company. I want to just move to our values first. So we value honesty. We speak the truth even when it's bad news. We don't keep things to ourselves and we promise things we know we can deliver on. We value mindfulness, <clears throat> which isn't the mindfulness you're thinking of. We're, we're aware of our actions and how they affect you and the larger community. We are mindful of our, of our clients' needs for quality and timely results, and we recognize that everyone has something to contribute. We also value sharing, so we're altruists at heart. We share our expertise, our processes, and our experiences to benefit the community and we do so without expectation. Everything we create is open source by default, unless a client would like us not, for that not to be the case. And we also value speaking plainly. We build trust by being patient translators and putting ourselves in others' shoes. We help you understand what you want and what you need, and we realize jargon is difficult, so we work very hard to hire people with empathy. I do have to say there is a caveat to this whole talk and this whole session. Your mileage may vary. It's um, pretty easy to look at what's happened over the last five years and have 2020 hindsight vision. We didn't plan it for it to go this way. Um, this is kind of a story of how things evolved for us and it's really a set of steps that I've distilled based on our experience just kind of thinking through what's happened the last number of years. 
I'll cover some cons and some advice at the end of the talk. And hopefully there'll be some discussion questions and the ability to interact as well. So I'm not sure that all these steps are going to be exactly the same for any team that is thinking about going distributed or any company. Be flexible. OK, so I want to go back to 2011, um, which is when we first started using our office in downtown Minneapolis, in the North Loop. So we purchased a, a condominium in a commercial building. It was actually a building that had six floors. The top two were residential, and the bottom four were commercial. And usually commercial condominium space in Minneapolis is really hard to find, and it still is. But we lucked out. This was a building that was made by some developers. The building had some problems. They had a real hard time trying to get rid of these uh, commercial condos, and so we made an offer, we bought the space, and we were, we were able to purpose build the inside of this condominium to do exactly what we wanted it to do. What I thought I wanted us to do, and did at the time. We bought the space because we thought it was a good investment, not just in real estate, but in the company itself, because it showed that we were committed to being in one environment together, learning at the same time. The idea was to have a single room with a giant table. So we had 12 desks put together in one long office space. The desks were actually doors that we bought, because that was the cheapest way to do it. And the legs were IKEA chairs, or IKEA legs. And we ordered 50 IKEA legs. So imagine the guy at the store when you're ordering 50 of the same leg. Are you sure you get this, got this number right? We're like, yes, we're sure. Just give us 48. Five? We'll take two extra for fun. Um, and the idea was to be together. We were joined by the table to do the same work metaphorically and physically. Collaboration was key. And in my opinion, it was important to be together to do that because how else could you learn but by being together and looking over someone's shoulder or checking the screen, sliding over. We also had slippers. That was fun. So you walk into the office, you take your shoes off, you put your slippers on, you're ready to work. We had a breakfast bar and a kitchen. And at one point we had an arcade, but that, that didn't last for very long. The biggest issue we had was fighting distraction. So being in an open office plan, even with music that you can control, still leads to questions that are uh, being asked when you're trying to focus. It still leads to people having discussions on one end of the table that are disturbing people in the other end of the table. And trying to keep focus was, I think, a continued uh, process. And what ends up happening is people end up putting on their headphones and kind of just zoning out. And that's kind of the meaning, like, don't touch me, don't talk to me, hit me on Slack. So that was the biggest thing. Otherwise, it worked really well. I'd hoped that um, the office would be a constant, a point of reference, something that we could rally around. But the reality of life is everything changes, right? So staff members change, different people come on board, some people leave, work gets more complex. Um, the things you're working on, your team starts to master and they start to ask for more complex work, even more complex work. That comes in the door, you're spending more time on these things, you're, getting, uh, you're, you're charging more money, the budgets are larger, the tools that you're using change, and they generally get better. Um, so fast forward to 2016, where a fair amount of things have changed in the last five years. One of the biggest things that happened to us around that time is we had one awful client um, that caused us a ton of introspection um, and meant that we actually needed to create our own set of values. Not create them, but just identify what they are and identify what that what that what what the meanings were to us. And I talked about this at uh, TC Drupal in 2016. 
at a session called Know Yourself First. So if you're interested to hear about that story, just uh, go to that short link there. Um, the best thing about having this awful client was that it helped us establish our values. And most importantly, it supported a sense of trust amongst us. Like knowing what our values are, knowing that we can work together and problem solve, and that there is trust. So the first step in this process is decide that you're actually going to try. Decide that you're going to make a difference in the way that you work. It's kind of step zero. The trust part sets up step one, a team culture that supports a sense of trust. So we were lucky we ran into that client. Uh, we did a lot of hard work to get around it. And to this day, we continue to maintain trust between ourselves. If your team doesn't have trust, you're probably in an environment that um, has a culture of distrust, probably micromanagement. Um, it's, it's a culture of butts and seats means productivity. It's a culture of, oh, I need to be able to see my team to make sure they, they're actually doing something. And this guy is the prototypical manager that freaks out when no one's in the queue because something needs to be done. The reality is that if you have trust amongst your team and, um, and you realize that everybody's an adult, you don't need to see those people to ensure that the work is going to get done. You trust that it's going to get done. And so if you're going to embark on becoming distributed as a team or a company, you have to have that basal layer. So that's step one. When was the first inkling that I thought that maybe this would be something that we would do after being so gung-ho that we were all in the same place at the same time? Well, the first inkling was in 2016 um, at DrupalCon New Orleans. Uh, I went to the business summit at that conference and I talked to a number of people who owned companies that had already become distributed, many of whom I respect and, and um, admire, Lullabot, Four Kitchens. And they all talked about it in, very positive, in a very positive light, light. And then I went to a talk that Anne Stefan Stefanik from Canopy Studios gave. And the, the name of the talk is Live the Dream, Work Remote build a successful distributed Drupal shop. All of these things came together. I was totally inspired by um, DrupalCon New Orleans, had a ton of ideas in my head, and then went back to Minneapolis um, to think about if this was really something that we could do. And I had to process it for a couple of days. And I brought it to the team on the Monday morning staff meeting and asked for opinions. And um, what I quickly figured out is that we needed a reason why we were doing this. So the next step is define why. So make sure that you have trust. First of all, decide you're going to do it, right? Step zero. Make sure you have trust in an environment that supports trust. And then define why. Why are you going to do this? So we didn't have a single reason. We had a whole bunch of reasons. And um, some of them were like practical. Like snow commutes are a time suck, especially in Minnesota, especially in downtown Minneapolis. If you live in California, it's probably traffic. If it's some big city, it's probably the commute. So like practical reasons why, why we should try doing this. Parking. It's the North Loop in 2016. Like, there's no parking there. There's absolutely no way to get parking. And all the parking spots that we had were literally being taken away from us because they needed the space for another building. Timing. Timing was important. Like, we started talking about it. I got excited. And as people at 10.7 know, when I get excited about something, it tends to take out a amount of its own, right? Like Kubernetes or whatever, right? 
it also felt like our next step. So it kind of, it's a kind of a squishy thing to talk about, but sometimes you know, like, oh, I need to hire someone because I've got too much to do. That's kind of squishy. You could look at the metrics, but you kind of know when you need to hire someone. This also felt like a an, an step in the evolution of 10.7. So that was another reason we should do it. Also, others were doing it, which is never a good reason, but it was something that we thought about. It kind of, it kind of gives you the sense that, um, well, they're doing it, and they seem to be doing fine, and we've talked to them, and the problems that they've talked about seem surmountable. They don't seem like a huge problem. We should maybe try doing this. And so we did. We, we decided we would experiment and gave ourselves the option to back out if we needed to, um, which is a luxury. We owned the space. It wasn't like we were going to be breaking a five-year lease. If we had to leave, we could either lease the space out in a hot neighborhood or sell it. And the intention was to lease it if we were going to move out. So kind of all of the parameters um, really came together nicely to allow us this um, flexibility to experiment. So we had a good reason for why. So the next step here is, OK, it's an experiment. And as the leader of the team, it's my job to do everything I can to support the team in this transition. So the next step is support your team. You want to make it as frictionless as possible. We're doing this. We've never done this before. It's not just my job to make it frictionless. It's my job to trust the team and to do everything I can to make their lives easier. So the things that we learned that I needed to support was a dedicated space at home for work. Turns out that if you have a space at home that you go to and you always work, you're actually more productive than just going from place to place in your house. And you also have to be sensitive to your employees and to your team members because some people don't have a space to work at home. You know, They might live in a one bedroom apartment where both spouses are at work the whole day and so they don't need an extra room. So you have to be sensitive to that. A great chair. Support your team members. A great chair. If you don't have one, invest in one. They're amazing. Or a standing desk. Some people love standing desks. If there was a standing desk in the office, have them take that standing desk home. High-speed internet. Also important. Do everything you can to help your team make sure they have high-speed internet. Some places that's hard, but with intelligent um, high-speed cell phone networks, it's possible to come up with a, a way to do that as well. You also want to be able to support real-time video and chat. And please pay for it because you get what you pay for. Don't, don't use something that um, maybe won't be as great as if you had actually paid for the chat and the video. So we have a technology stipend at 10.7. And um, what happens with that is the, the dollars accrue every month on your PEX card. And some other companies have that as well. I, I think Lullabot does. I don't know if Pantheon does. But the tech stipend allows our employees to purchase whatever technology needs they have, purchase whatever devices they have, or pay for a higher grade of, of high-speed internet at home. And that provides the um, additional support that, that we do. And then there are probably some expectations from the whole team as well. So keep, it, keep each other informed. You want to be able to make sure that people know what you're doing and when you're doing it. Have a way to do group chat. And if you can, use video. We have a couple of rules around chat and video, and I'll get to those later. But as a team that's distributed, you're expected to be available during office hours, whenever your office hours are. Use group chat to communicate, and if you ever can, default to video. It's way better than text. And this is an important one. Treat your team members as your fellow adults. We're all able to make decisions, so we should all make those decisions, and we should all make those mistakes as well. Like We will learn from these things. You don't you don't have as much um, 
you don't have as much of a chance to visibly see someone failing when they're out there. So making sure that they have that permission to do that is important. And then live your values and make decisions based on them. So if one of your values is transparency or sharing or open source, make sure that you're doing the things that support those values. So the next step is to experiment. Nothing's set in stone. We want to be able to iterate on this process to become fully distributed. Give yourself some time to experiment, but not forever. You should have some idea that this is something that is finite. Don't let yourself think that this experiment is going to go on forever. You're allowed to change course, just give yourself a time limit. The experiment that we did was everybody works from home on Fridays. And we gave us the permission to change that to any other day or to stop doing that if it didn't work out. One of the key decisions we made was to actually all take the same day off at home at the same time, as opposed to saying, we're going to choose one day a week, anybody can work from home, whichever day it is, you choose. We decided we'll all be at home, we'd all experience the same problems at the same time and try to resolve them. We decided on Fridays because the end of the week, quite honestly, is um, not terribly productive, especially on a Friday afternoon in the office. You know, happy hour is coming up, all of that stuff's going on. We felt like we wouldn't lose anything or that we would lose less if we stayed at home on Fridays. So that was a safe way to do it. And then we iterated. We added a second day. So we went Wednesdays and Fridays. And I think we went um, Fridays for about three or four weeks. And then we added Wednesdays, and that didn't last very long. Um, it just felt weird because we were in the office for two days, and then we were off, and then we were back, and then we were off. And it felt like the whole week was being um, broken up. So we kept the two days, but we switched it to Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that gave us more of a, like a feeling of um, pace. It was a good pace to that. It wasn't broken up. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. And that worked a whole lot better for us than Wednesdays and Fridays. And I thought about maybe a good way to approach this would have been to do it linearly. So start on Monday, then add Tuesday, then add Wednesday, then add Thursday, then add Friday, and boom, you're distributed. Ah, it doesn't work like that. that. I'm so glad we didn't do that. If you think about um, iterating in that, fa in that fashion, I would recommend against it. it just, it's just not how the work week evolves. And this went on for months. I mean, we were Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday for months. And so I thought, all right, this is working out great, right? Um, we're in a groove. We're going to be hybrid for, for a while. Well, don't get too comfortable. Like, remember that time, that time frame that you have to give yourself. Things change. A new project comes in. You lose a project, you get a bigger budget, client requirements change, team members change. You realize you're in a transition, so not so fast. I think we were hybrid. I say hybrid because I, I call it hybrid because we were all in the same place at the same time. We were either all in the office or all at home. And to me, that's a good mixture. So um, it was comfortable. We were getting time at home. We were getting time in the office. I like both of those things. Until someone thought something else. And someone came to me and said, I'd like to be remote all of the time. Um, I said, what? That's crazy. We're having so much fun. Why would you want to do that? And of course, he uh, gave me some good reasons. Right? He said, uh, it's working pretty well. It's, I mean, we're getting things done. Uh, I'm more productive at home than I am in the office. Like, like you want that for me, right? 
I don't have the reduced, like the distractions I do in the office that I do at home. You want that for me as well, right? And also there's the commute. So like the commute still sucks. And the comment there was, I can't find parking. It takes me an hour and a half to get to work and to actually set my computer up. It takes me an hour and a half to get home. Like that's three hours of time I'm totally wasting. And of course, like I couldn't say no to that. He brought up excellent points. So I had to kind of make a decision, right? What are we going to do? So that's the next step. Make a decision. Eventually you have to. It's okay to experiment. Don't do it forever. It's okay to take your time. You just know that at some point, someone is going to need to say something and decide what you're going to do. So here are some of the things we realized. We realized that after we'd been coasting for a few months, that really there was no reason to be physically bound to the office. Everything we did at the office, we could do at home equally successfully. We also realized that no client had visited us in the office in the last two years, which kind of is an important thing because that's one of the reasons you have an office. Usually, people come to see you. We were visiting our clients. Like there was no reason to have an office just for a client to come in and see us. And we also, we also realized, hey, we own the office. There's no lease consideration. Like that's not a big deal for us, right? Um, whereas if you're leasing from someone else, you're probably locked into a long-term contract. So that might put the brakes on um, actually becoming distributed. And so after these realizations, we had to decide what kind of company we were going to be. And so I want to throw up some definitions of different types of companies. So a co-located company would be a company that has offices where everybody is physically present. A co-located company that's remote first has offices, but they're flexible on being remote. I would not say we were co-located remote first. I would say we were hybrid, like I said earlier. It's not going to come up here. Um, a good example of a co-located remote first company is GitHub. GitHub has uh, their main office in San Francisco. Everybody who gets hired by GitHub has the option of being remote first, but they're required to come into the main office for onboarding. You're basically given the option of staying at home the whole time, except this one time. And so GitHub's a great example of this flexible, co-located remote first definition. And of course, the third one is distributed. Um, everyone is remote. So everyone is at home or in Hawaii or wherever they want to be, they get to be distributed. And so the last step is someone has to make the call. And we decided, I decided we would be distributed. And this is the photo of the last day that we were at 10-7 where we were actually in the office to do work that day. And it was kind of liberating. Like, I made the decision in the staff meeting. It was Monday. We we're like, okay, so I can just take my stuff home. I don't have to come back tomorrow. Yeah, that's kind of it. Everybody just goes home and we'll see you on Slack. So I want to recap the steps here. Let me go back one. Step zero is make the decision that you're going to try to do something about becoming distributed. So the first step, you need to make sure your team or your company has a culture that supports trust. This is um, crucial to making sure that you have a highly functioning team that you trust that can get work done without you actually having eyeballs on them all the time. Define why you're going to be di uh, distributed. There has to be a good reason to do it, whether it's the clients aren't visiting you, or the commute sucks, or we can do this from home. Figure out a reason. Support your team. As a leader, you should make it frictionless for your employees, for your team members, to do what they need to do at home. Whatever amenities they had in the office, they should have the same, if not better, amenities at home. 
give your chance give yourselves the chance to experiment and don't let that take forever also don't get comfortable things are going to change and eventually you're going to need to make a decision and once you've made that decision then you're distributed I guess if that's what you decide <laughs> kind of looks easy <laughs> actually all right some challenges Workspace from home, I've mentioned that. Um, it took us about a month, maybe a little more, to figure out exactly what you needed at home to be productive. And a dedicated space was one of those things. So sometimes that's a challenge. Another major challenge, or another, ma another challenge that is major, is isolation and mental health. Isolation is a problem. You get cabin fever, and you have to come up with ways of dealing with that. So when someone is feeling like they are isolated, you'll usually notice that they go to a coffee shop, or they will ask when the next in-person is. So as a distributed company, we still have in-persons. In fact, TC Drupal Camp is one of our in-persons this year. So we get a chance to see each other. We'll have dinner tonight before the party, we met up this morning for um, donuts. It's important to know that these things are issues and to have strategies to deal with them. Some companies that are larger like Lullabot have retreats. They have a whole company retreat or they'll have team retreats. That's, that's um, the typical way that distributed companies see each other and uh, make sure they have in-person time. Since we, are, since we are based in Minneapolis and everybody's in the greater Twin Cities region, uh, region it's easier for us to have an in-person in a library or at TC Drupal. A sense of trust and having the right culture. And I don't know if, if it's the right culture, but it's a culture that um, celebrates trust and that um, enables people to do their best work without having to look over their sho uh, shoulders. Some teams just aren't up at that level yet and might not have as much luck as other teams in becoming distributed. Prioritization. How do you know what you're going to work on and what's important if um, our project manager at the end of the table isn't screaming about the client that's got a hot issue, side is down? Like you have, to have a, you have to have a way of prioritizing work. And we use an issue tracker. You've probably heard of JIRA. The, that's not enough. You do have to have a stand-up. So we have a daily stand-up at 9.30. We, we go through all of the issues that need to be dealt with. We look at all the support tickets that have come in. And we have a way of prioritizing. So that can be a challenge, but there are tools and ways to get around that. Benefits and taxes. Those are a challenge. It's easy for us because we have all of our employees now in Minnesota. We have someone in um, Michigan. But if you have the right um, uh, providers, that's something that can be taken care of as well. Uh, there are PEOs as well that will take care of that for you. We're not a part of one, so I don't know the details of that, but that's something else you can look into. I think it stands for uh, Professional Employer Organization. That's about as much as I know. And then another challenge is work-life focus. I know people call this work-life balance as well, and I would rather people stop calling it that because it's re rather it's really work-life focus. It's where you should choose to focus your life or your work. And there is a risk to, fo to uh, spending too much time on work when you are at home because it's easy. And so that becomes a challenge as well. You want to be able to focus on life when you're at home as well. So having a workspace that's a little bit away from where the rest of life happens in your house, that's maybe a benefit. Um, but it's also a benefit to keep hours and to do that uh, in a strict way. So those are challenges that we deal with all the time. Some advice. Doing OK for time here. Almost done. Invest in the right tools. There's about five categories of tools that you really should be looking at. You need a good video conferencing system. We've had a lot of great luck with Zoom. We've tried all of them. Zoom seems to come out 
tops every time. Um, pay for it if you can. It helps. You need some sort of business chat system. We use Slack. It feels like that's the de facto standard, but there's a Microsoft product and there's some other product. You know, I don't know. There's Slack. Right. Rocket Tech. Rocket Tech. I don't know Rocket Chat. That's an open source. Open source? Slack. Okay. Since you're already using Zoom, did you consider just using Zoom? For chat? Uh, no. Okay. Does Zoom have channels? Do they have? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. No? Okay. Channels are a big deal for us in Slack. Yeah. The channels in history is actually very important for us because it is an informal way of tracking key pieces of information that people forget because people are human. Like, what was the address for that stage server again? <laughs> That's a pinned message. Now, That's a pin now I don't need to answer that. They know that. Go to that project's channel. Go to the pinned messages. It's right there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so that's why I said pay for it because you don't get the history. You don't get the search. Yeah, so Rocket Chat exactly does the same thing because the Slack does. You can get all the level of integrations of the apps that you would like to. And it's an open source, so you get all the control over the source on how you As well. I, can't, I like the sound of that. It maintains the history. Yeah, fine. You can control that work. You want to maintain the history for six months, three days, 30 days. Whatever you want. Choose that, yeah. Rocket Chat. I'm going to look at that. Thank Rocket you. Chat. So that was two. Three, file sharing. We use Google Drive. You can use Dropbox, whatever else. Issue tracking, um, we use Jira. You can use Trello or Basecamp. We outgrew Basecamp. Jira works well for us. And then have a good calendar system as well. Um, we use Google Calendar, but we also have one vacation calendar that everyone will use that they invite that, that calendar to so that we know what everyone's availability is. Um, so make sure you invest in the right tools. Uh, have an attendance channel in your uh, Slack. I know it sounds dumb, but um, having it is really, really useful to know whether someone's in the office or not. When you show up at your desk and you're working, just put in that you're there. Um, we've reduced the number of status meetings we have to five that have uh, different icons so that they are visually easily distinguishable. So we have, uh, I'm here, I'm away, I'm out, um, which means I'm not working. Away means I'm not at my desk, um, I'm taking lunch or a coffee break. Um, I'm in a meeting and I have focus time. And they're all visually distinct so that um, you can easily tell what they are. You don't have to rely on color and so on. Um, we have a 30 minute rule. If you're banging your head against the table for 30 minutes and you're not getting anywhere with anything, ask someone for help, please, whichever way you can. Don't keep spending your time on something that you're obviously not having any luck with. Um, and then another rule we have is go to video as soon as possible. If you're having a Slack conversation with more than two people and it's an intricate description of a code or a problem or like someone should say, can we zoom about this? And then do that. So try to do that as soon as you can. Um, and work in your workspace and try to keep good office hours. It doesn't matter what your hours are. Do you work in one space? Maybe shift to another space if you have to, to ease it up, but try to keep to the same place and keep office hours and let people know what those office hours are. Some people like to work in the mornings and then take a two hour break and then come back later. Totally fine, just let us know. And then change your scenery. Um, changing your scenery fights isolation. You know, you're, you're likely to have cabin fever if you don't kind of change it up every now and again. Um, go to five watt coffee or Peace Coffee, or um, to the Barnes & Noble, wherever there's good Wi-Fi. Change it up. I like to go outside and spend time with my dog. Um, and I play with her and teach her stuff. And this is a plug for her Instagram account. So you should, <laughs> you should check that out. Uh, but that's, I've had a dog for nine months. And it's a new thing for me. And uh, it absolutely gives me the ability to totally change mindsets from being down on a computer, on a screen, working, and just shifting gears and throwing a little tennis ball because her mouth is like this big. So. <laughs> She's a mini.
Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, hiring. Uh, hiring. Both the trust and even if you do trust them, are they uh, focused enough when they're not being nagged, I guess? Yeah, that's... How do you identify it? There are some people that are better off in an office setting. Um, that's a really great question and probably a session like you could okay. do all on its own. But I will, I will try to answer that um, as best I can. Um, so we tried to hire someone last year um, and we put out a job description and we had a ton of response um, and we whittled it down and we thought we were doing a great job. And um, the idea was get to three candidates give them a task, a small project, have them work on it, and then reevaluate them and see which one's the best cultural fit, which one came out with the best work. And what we realized was, um, well, we tried to make an offer and it just fell apart. It didn't work out. So we didn't hire. We, we ended up not hiring. And at one of our in-persons, we kind of did a retrospective on that and said, okay, what the heck happened? And someone in the room said, um, I don't think we've ever hired anyone. Like, off the bat, full time. Look at everyone around the table. All of us here were contractors first, part time, then full time, and then got hired on as employees. And so what I realized was, yeah, that's that's exactly the the um, the problem that we had. Um, so the strategy now is to try to work with as many contractors and freelancers on a part time basis as possible, and do that in such a way so that you can kind of figure out the work style, figure out if I give this person 10 hours of work, like, do they ask me questions, do they come back with the work with a final product, like, what's the style? And I think that's a lower risk as well, but it also gives you a, a better idea of the people that would fit with the other people that work in your company. Okay. So that's the approach. Thank you. Any other questions, Steve? Are there certain tasks or conversation that you save for the in-person time? Um, not really. Retros. Oh, oh, from okay. So from my perspective, uh, I typically don't save anything that I have to see the team to say. I will say whatever I need to say in a staff meeting on Monday in Zoom. Um, in in the in person, um, I do tend to kind of do summaries. Like here's what we did over the last three months. This is what I'm thinking of, and maybe it's the end of the year. Here are what the benefits look like. Um, but from a, like from a team perspective, Tess is right. I think we'll we'll do a retrospective in person. We found that doing retros in person is actually really useful because that's a inherently a high bandwidth conversation, and usually we don't do it the first thing in the morning. Usually it's an afternoon task, and by then people are more relaxed. They're a little less constrained. They're more awake. They're more receptive to being open about what they're talking about. And that's really useful at the end of a long project to review what's going on, what went well, what didn't go well, what we would have done differently, what were the red flags, how did we miss those red flags if we missed those red flags, and so on. And that is really useful because, one, you don't actually have to do the retrospective of a project the day after it's done. In fact, I find that's actually less effective. I prefer to sit on a project and wait for it to for fester to fester. I let I let the I let the, the the feeling and the perspective of it kind of refine over over a couple days or a couple weeks, and that actually helps me get perspective on how I feel about that project and gives me additional thoughts as well. Cool. Any other questions? One is, it was a question, but then you answered it, so it's more of an observation. Okay. You use the phrase work from home a lot, but um, it sounds like a lot of people work other than from home. So, coffee shops or people tie into like vacations, like stretch their time in a vacation location, an extra couple of days of work during office hours then? Or? Um, so, I think I tend to say work from home because I think of all of the team members and I know they're all at home. Okay. <laughs> so, that's why I've been saying that. Um, but that's not necess that doesn't have to be the case. Um, so I, I guess it would be work from five watt for Tess yeah, on some days. Just kind of a weird 
situations. I, I knew a friend of mine who worked, you know, person who worked from home, and he was at a coffee shop, and they got that kind of shape that he wasn't at home. And it's home. Oh, I, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, you can work from wherever you are, wherever you want. All right, we should probably wrap it up unless there's anything else. No. Thanks, everybody.